Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be on advanced features and workflow improvements within Clip Studio Paint, and it will be presented by PJ Holden. So before we begin the webinar, um, there are some housekeeping items I'd like to review with everyone. Uh, the webinar will be approximately an hour long. All attendees will be muted. The Q&A session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. The recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. Today's panelists are myself, Fahim Niaz, Joanna from Celsius, and PJ, who will be actually leading the webinar. For those of you who are joining us for the first time and those who haven't heard of Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. For more information, please check out our website at clipstudio.net forward slash en and as well as graphicsly.com. And with that, today's webinar, as mentioned earlier, will be on advanced features and workflow improvements with comic artist PJ Holden. With that, I will pass the reins of the webinar over to PJ and he'll begin his discussion. Hello there. Uh, I'm hoping you can all hear me. Uh, my name is PJ Holden, as Fahim has kindly introduced me. Uh, I'm a professional comic artist. Um, for those of you uh, that don't know my work, I'm best known for drawing Judge Dredd for 2000 AD. Uh, I have also, so I've been drawing Dredd professionally for, since about 2000. Uh, I turned 30 and became a professional comic artist, so I'll give you some faith if you're a little bit older. Um, but prior to that, I worked in IT for, uh, oh my goodness, from the age of about 14 doing um, uh, in installations, software engineering, programming, and all sorts of things. So I, I've kind of got a good grinding in general computer work. And um, with, I took that with me when I went into, into drawing comics. I've been using uh, Clip Studio since it was Manga Studio. Uh, I think version three was, was probably the first one. And I've kind of found myself um, becoming one of those people on, on Twitter who tends to help others with, with Clip Studio. I tend to kind of I, I like kind of figuring out ways to shave minutes off what I'm trying to do. Uh, the focus of, of this particular presentation is really about how can we kind of um, speed up certain repetitive, repetitive processes. How do we get from, uh, you know, how do we save 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there? Uh, and, and you know, hopefully a sort of cumulative total of 20 minutes per page, which doesn't sound like a lot. I mean, if you're spending an hour, or if you're spending four or five hours on a single page of artwork, 20 minutes sounds like nothing. But over the course of a year, 20 minutes per page can really mount up and can save you days of, of work. So, and and these are generally once uh, once we I'll go through lots of little uh, little giant, tiny little hints and tips and things you can change and alter and, and make a little uh, minor improvements to. Well, once you've switched these things on, they're always available to you. So sometimes they take maybe 10 minutes to set up, but once they're set up, they take milliseconds then to use. So I'm going to go through a couple of things that, that I do generally on a brand new installation. The, the Clip Studio that I'm running currently, uh, it's the one I've been using for a long, long time, but I've reset everything back to default. So this is kind of what Clip Studio looks like when it's brand new out of the box. Um, if you are like me and you have been using Clip Studio for a long time and you're kind of, uh, you, you've set various things and you, and you actually want to go back to the, the kind of the, the bare bones of Clip Studio, all you have to do really is start Clip Studio Paint up by uh, pressing the shift key and clicking the Clip Studio icon and it'll come up and say, do you want to reset various tools? And you can reset all of the tools. I would recommend though you do a backup of those settings first of all before resetting them because if you do a backup, you can then kind of bring them all back in again. So what I'm going to talk about first of all is um, some of the basic things I, I, I like to set up on a, on a computer. Um, First of all, uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm using a, a Cintiq, um, a Wacom Cintiq 27 inch, um, but I generally do this on all my Cintiqs. Uh, and depending, uh, 27 inch is a massive screen. Um, it's, it's a huge amount of real estate. Uh, but if you have a smaller screen, these things are actually really, really useful. Uh, the first thing I would say, and this isn't Clip Studio Paint related, but it, it is useful within Clip Studio Paint, is to um, take, 
Oh, this clip's you just saving my, my information, that's handy, um, is to take the sentence within uh, the Cintiq and, and map the first button on the Cintiq to the, the space bar. And the reason you do that is when you press the space bar, you'll, you'll know it turns into the hand icon. Um, now, there we go. You'll know that when you press the space bar, it'll turn into the hand icon. By mapping that first button, this first button here, to the, the hand icon, it means that you've always got that button immediately to hand and so you're sort of basically using the the uh, Cintiq to move the screen around. I tend to map the um, second button to undo uh, and that just means again if I want to undo I can use the same uh, digit to undo uh, and then the third thing I do is generally in uh, within the sentence of Clip Studio Paint um, Clip Studio Paints or Razor is uh, quite handy. I always set it to sort of what's called anti-aliasing, turn that down to none, uh, and that gives me a nice hard edge when I'm erasing stuff, so there's no kind of, you know, you're, you're definitely getting something erased. erased. Uh, but the other thing I always do is within the settings of that is set the brush size so that it changes based on the size on screen. And what that means is if I zoom in on a screen uh, like so, that brush size then, is a consistent size. If I zoom out, that brush size is consistent. And it, it just it just makes it a wee bit quicker to sort of erase things. And again, this is about shaving seconds, milliseconds off what you're doing. And it's a very quick way to kind of uh, make it slightly more usable. So that said, uh, having done that with it with my pen, uh, the first thing I generally do is within the settings of, of Clip Studio is I, the, within the preferences here, um, there's a bunch of things I'll usually play with. Uh, in the uh, cursor, uh, I set, I tend to set the, I'm gonna leave it on brush size here so you can see this easier, but I tend to set it to single pixel dot. What what that does is just takes the the cursor away from you. So when you're, when you're going to draw, it's just a tiny dot, you can't see it. It's just you and the pen and the drawing. That makes it a little bit easier to work on. Uh, and I use that, that single pixel dot for all the drawing that I normally do. Um, so it's not, you can see here, there's a little, if you can see it here, so I'm gonna put it in the center of that little thing there. Uh, right now my cursor is a little circle. If I increase the size of that, you'll see the size of that cursor getting bigger, which is great, but really uh, one of the things that you wanna try and get away from is increasing and decreasing the size of the pen. Uh, what I tend to do is stick to a certain pen size and use that for everything. And again, this is about uh, speed. It's about making you a little bit faster at drawing, um, if you use the same pen size all the time, you become consistent, and consistency is king when it comes to stuff like this. Um, there are other things that I, I do within the preferences. Um, one of the first things I do here is um, I'll turn on rulers there. So I've got rulers switched on. You can see a kind of ruler along the, the top with little notches. Uh, you can set the unit of length of that ruler to be anything. It defaults, uh, Clip Studio Paint defaults to using pixels. Um, so where are we, uh, da, 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 units. So you can see unit of length is measured in pixels and the text units measured in point size. Point size is great, you wanna keep that. Uh, most fonts are measured in point size. But the unit of length, I tend to move to millimeters. And the reason I do that is that um, unless all of your graphics are for the web, generally you're working for print. And if you're working for print, millimeters is the important measurement. Um, uh, you want a, a page that's you know, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters, for example. Uh, that has a number of pixels associated with it. But you know that's, that's, that's kind of something you want to avoid worrying about because now, having set the unit length to millimeters, it means the brush pens are all measured in a consistent size as well. These, these, these brushes, if I set the brush to one, I'll get a line that thickness. If I create a new document that's 150 DPI, uh, but uh, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters, I'll get exactly the same brush size. So it keeps the consistency of the brush size. Um, hopefully I'm not going through these too too quickly. Now I'm gonna show you another preference. This is, this is for uh, setting up panel borders. I will change these now, but we'll come back to doing panel borders later. Uh, this is again, this is about consistency. Um, it's, you may prefer, you may actually quite like the, the way that uh, Clip Studio defaults in, on, on these measurements. Um, it defaults to, as you can see here, a vertical gutter of eight 
uh, 0.8 millimeters and a horizontal gutter of 1.5 millimeters. Uh, what that means is that the um, horizontal gutter is slightly uh, further apart. Um, and that, that is a, a thing I think that you see quite a lot in manga, but less in US and UK comics. Uh, because I'm a, a 2000 AD artist, the 2000 AD style guidelines going back 30 years or so suggest that you have those gutters to five millimeters. So that's what I always do. So I set them to five millimeters. And it just means that whenever I create a brand new uh, page with new panel borders, it will always have a five millimeter gutter whenever I create new panel uh, gutters. The next thing, and this is a thing that a lot of people hear, a lot of people miss in Clips View, is this thing called display resolution. What this means is this measurement here is the resolution of your, uh, your screen. And the reason that you key it in is that when you've keyed this in correctly, uh, sorry, when you key this in and it's correct uh, on this, for example, it's 110 DPI, what happens is there's a button that says view this as print size. Now, if you've set up a page that's 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters and you set this dis display resolution correctly, if you then go view this as print resolution, so view as uh, print size there, it'll actually display it so that on screen and on the piece of paper, if you got a ruler out, you could measure that and it will be 100 by 100. It will be an accurate fit. Now, I use this a lot because the, the, the method that I tend to use is I will, um, my first stage of drawing is typically pencils on uh, analog, so traditional pencils um, at the, you know, the appropriate size of, of uh, depending on the comic, it, it, it'll either be uh, larger or smaller. So uh, 2000 AD styles is, is closer to A3 size. Uh, I will then create a digital page, which is exactly the same measurements in the computer. So digital, and I will scan that in. And by scan that, that print size in there, it will display it in here exactly to match the digital print size. If I then do the uh, view as print size on screen, view uh, print size, what I will see on my display will actually be a one-to-one -one representation of the digital and the analog. I could actually take this, this page here, this physical page, and put it on top of my computer screen and see that they match exactly. Uh, and it, again, it's just about making sure that if you draw a face that's a certain size, it will be the right size. It will not be too big or too small. Um, it will be exactly what you expect it to be when you print it. Um, and I tend to work, uh, because most of the stuff I do starts traditionally, I tend to work at about 40% larger than, than print size. So the page sizes that I use tend to be 40% larger than print size. So the other thing I do, and this is very helpful, I think, um, in when you come to, uh, let's see, canvas, there we go. When it comes to uh, digital drawing is, you'll see here the scales of zoom. These are, these are the steps that you can zoom in and out of, of an image. Um, it goes from 0.78 all the way up to 3,200%, uh, which is an insane level of zoom. Uh, I tend to delete almost all of these. I want. I don't ever want to get any closer than maybe 110%, something like that. In fact, if I'm totally honest, 50% is as close as I ever want to get into the page. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you get, if you go to 3,500% and start inking faces, you will never, you will never see those in print. They will never be seen. Um, if you get to 50% and start inking faces, they're quite small so that you can sort of miss them a little bit, but at least that upper limit will stop you draw, doing artwork that is never seen by anyone. That's that's the big advantage. Uh, the display resolution is not set here because again, it's a default setting. Uh, the, the way it actually works is pretty cool. You, you press this set and measure, you get a physical ruler out and put it up against your computer screen and then move this little bar until the, the uh, ruler that you're seeing here, you see this little ruler that's in centimeters, the ruler matches the physical ruler. And once the physical ruler and the ruler match, that gives you your, your accurate DPI. So you can then kind of set the resolution of the screen. Uh, so I'll set this right now to 110 because I know that's what it was. And uh, I'll let's get rid of some of these. So, uh, and I'll get rid of some of these other, 0.07 is a tiny amount. Um, and so we'll have that in there. So I tend to limit myself to a couple of steps uh, and okay. And you'll see if I press plus now, you'll see I can't get any using the uh, plus and minus 
measurements, they go in those steps that we calculated in. If I go to view uh, print size, that goes to the kind of the print size of the page. So, uh, which is actually slightly wrong at the moment because I've zoomed the screen in, so you can you can see it on your your monitors hopefully. Um, so that's some of the those are some of the preferences, and there are preferences that generally most people miss because the you know once you've installed Clip Studio, everyone wants to get into draw. You just, the first thing you want to do is start drawing on it, and so you kind of miss these things. And uh, the thing is, once they're set, they're done. You don't need to worry about those things ever again. But they're kind of important and they're very very useful to to set up. So. Other things I tend to go into to change is that um, Clip Studio has a way of setting up any number of shortcut keys, uh, and it has a whole bunch of sensible defaults, P for pen, uh, P for pencil as well. That means if you press P, you'll get a pen. If you press P again, you'll get the pencil. If you press P again, you'll go back to pen. So it'll sort of cycle through all of those. Uh, B for airbrush and so on. You can, if you want, change any of these, which is great. So for example, if you tend to find yourself using the airbrush a lot, you could change that for the letter A or, or some other uh, letter equivalent. And then that way, it's a very quick and easy way to get to the letter A or get to the airbrush tool. You can also, uh, with the shortcuts, when you're using the, the drawing tool, um, you can, for example, hold a key down. And when you hold the key down, the tool will change temporarily to that tool. So it is only that tool until you let go of the key again. So it's a great way, for example, if you're drawing something, you can very quickly shift into gradient and then shift back out again. So you're drawn again uh, almost immediately afterwards. Um, there's a couple of uh, defaults that it doesn't have, which I always add on a new setup. Uh, they are, so if we go to file and um, shortcut settings, and you'll see all the different uh, things that can have shortcuts. There's loads of them. Um, the very first thing I always uh, always do is you'll see fill here, uh, and fill has a whole bunch of different kinds of fills within it. So uh, fill is G, which is also the same as gradient, but I actually use fill more than gradient, so I, I tend to change that to the letter F for fill, uh, and then that's that's fine. Now that means now anytime I press the letter F, if I do a little face there. If, press the letter F now I've got a fill tool and I can turn that off again. And you can see instantly how you know how fast that is then to start filling in uh, areas of uh, for inking. And um, again if if the if you hold it too long or if it sort of gets stuck there as it will do sometimes, uh, you can just press the P to come back to pen. Um, I also, there's a thing called Quick Masks, and uh, Quick Masks is available in Clip Studio, but most people I don't think know about it. Quick Masks is a way of kind of, if I mask off an area like this, um, I can actually, that's so now you, if you've used masks before, you'll know what that, that anything I draw within that cube there will be fine. Outside of that cube is, is, uh, is masked off. But I can also, if I go to view Quick Masks, um, selection quick mask you'll see now that red area is the area that i'm allowed to draw and i can actually draw on that red area so now the mask that i created includes those areas that i've drawn in so if i go back to selection quick mask and you can see now i can now, i can draw in that i and um a thing i'll do frequently is i'll add um the cue to the quick mask because it makes it much faster just to instead of going up to the selection quick mask every time I want I want to use it I just use the letter Q and away I go. So there's um there's a few things on Clip Studio which I think are great uh, that are not used often enough by most people. They are the command bar which is this bar I've drawn a little diagram to help you see it. Uh, this bar the command bar is this bit along the top here. I'm going to slowly kind of move my mouse over it, so hopefully you can see that. Uh, and the the distinguishing feature of this is if I press Tab to make all the other bits of the screen go away, this command bar stays exactly where it is. Now that means then that things like fill and clear and so on are all available to me. But I can add, I can propagate that with more things. There's no reason why that doesn't have uh, pen tools and so on in it. And so I'll often add extra things in there. Uh, and the, I mean, the way the way to do that is to go to uh, File and um, Command Bar Settings. And you'll see all of the same things that you saw in the shortcut key, so tools and so on. Uh, and the only difference is now is you can actually add those. So you'll see the button add. And when I press add, you'll see it just suddenly appears up there. So now I've got a pen tool on the command bar. And what that means again is if I if I maximize the screen as, I, as I've just done there, I've got that pen tool up here. 
Um, and you can, I mean, almost every single command uh, that you can use in there, every single tool that you can use, all of those things can actually be added to that command bar. Uh, and as we'll see later, you can also add not just tools, but you can create a set of actions, a set of different things that can be done, and they can be added on there, and you can stack them on top of each other. It just means then, uh, again, I've, I'm very lucky to have this large screen, but I've also used smaller screens. I've used 12-inch uh, screens, and you find that when you've got a 12-inch screen, that command bar becomes life uh, saving because you can put all the commonly used tools up there and um, you never have to see the rest of this. You can just hide all of this. So you've got almost everything is just drawing area. Um, so the other the other place that's a common place to add uh, shortcuts and commands and so on, sorry, I pressed the caps lock there, um, is the what's called the selection launcher. The selection launcher is if I take the selection tool, I'll draw a little box around that. So that's my selection area. The selection launcher is this little bar down at the bottom. And the selection launcher is exactly the same as the command bar in that you can add any command into there. Uh, the only difference is that it is uh, only visible when you've made a selection. Now, uh, to, to be honest, that used to annoy me. It used to annoy me this thing popped up, but having used it on smaller screens, I've now seen the, the, you know, how useful it really is. So you've got typically things on here are, I mean, there's fills, so I can fill that in very quickly. Um, I've got sort of uh, scale or rotate there. I've got copy and paste. I've got clear, so it'll clear everything inside it. I've got invert, which will invert the selection area um, and sort of clear selection. So deselect, so turn off that selection. Um, but again, it's also got this little option, selection launcher settings. I can tap on that. And from within there, I can select tools or I can select um, uh, other things I might I might want drawing colors and so on uh, that I can then add to that. So let's go with a set of options. Let's go for a tool and let's add the gradient tool to that. Okay, uh, so we can now add the gradient tool. So if I go now, you'll see I've added the gradient tool, and that just means I can just press there to get the gradient tool. And again. That becomes useful when you've got a full screen and you've got to do, if you're doing coloring or something and you need to do a lot of gradients, suddenly that, that tool is available to you instantly without having to call up this sidebar or, do, or press any other key. Um, there, there are two things that, that I find useful with, with um, it's great for a small screen because you can keep the most amount of screen available for drawing. And it's great for a big screen because when you've got a larger screen and you've got little arms like I have, sometimes you've got to reach quite far to get some of these tools. So they're, they're all the way over to the top left or top right. And you're you're trying to work in small details and trying to kind of minimize the amount of, of traveling your, your pen is doing. And again, these sounds like very strange little things to worry about, but over the course of, you know, you know I, I will draw 200, 300 pages in a year, in a given year. So anything that saves me 10 minutes on a page, I am grateful for. Um, so that's kind of, that's some of the preferences and some of the shortcuts. Uh, what I really want to talk about, the, the big thing that, that I'd like to chat about is uh, using a thing called auto actions. Auto actions, if you're not familiar with them, are a set of, it's basically a way to automate a bunch of actions or a bunch of steps that you would normally take. So for example, um, if you do something like, uh, if I select an area there like that, and a common thing for me might be to uh, uh, add a gradient or uh, to do an outline around it, for example, let's do an outline around it. So if I'm doing this and I can do uh, edit and um, uh, outline selection, and I'll do a little border around that. So there's there's a little border around that. And then I can do, um, use another tool like fill. So I'll fill that with uh, red, there we go. So that's, two steps and say I do that a lot. Say for example, if you're doing a comic that might have a dialogue box or a caption box that has got a red ins insert and a, a black outline around it, uh, those are two steps that you would do frequently. And because there are things that you do frequently and you do them repetitively and they're the same each time, you can automate those things. Uh, and now the way to do that, so what I'll do is I'll call up our auto action. This is auto action here. So auto action by default sort of appears on the, the, the side. I'm going to pull it out so we can see it a wee bit more detailed. Uh, auto action by default has a bunch of um, set kind of options here. So it's create draft layer, create tone, and so on. These are things that, that come by default. Um, I generally create a nice new set of auto actions. So we'll call this uh, Clip Studio, oh, Clip Studio, Demo, my keyboard is too far away. Uh, Clip Studio Demo, okay. So 
and we'll call this Redbox, okay? So right now, Redbox has no features within it whatsoever. We've got nothing in there. So the, the way to fill this is basically we know what we're going to do. So I'm going to do an outline, select an outline like that. Um, I'm going to press the record button. So basically what happens now is everything I do from here on in is going to be recorded. It's going to take a little record of exactly what steps I did, and it'll record not just what I did, but it'll record the settings that was used. So, for example, if I go up to Edit and Outline Selection, let's make that Outline Selection 4, like that, uh, draw on, on borders for 4 millimeters. That's quite big, but we'll, we'll do that anyway. Okay, uh, uh, that's a red border, so let's, uh, let's, let's stop that. Sorry. I forgot I changed my color back to red, so let's make our color black there. Um, actually, right, let's let's start recording. So we'll record this in now. So first step is to select black, change drawing color to black. The next step is to outline selection. So we'll just outline selection. We'll change that to two because four was a bit crazy. Uh, the next step then is to change it to red. And then the next, the final step is to fill it like that. And then we can stop recording. Um, now, this happens sometimes where you'll you'll start recording an action, you'll notice you've got something wrong. That's not a big deal because you can actually go back and from any of the stages here, start recording. And the thing is that whenever you run the action, it'll replay those steps in the order that you've given them. So for example, not, the, the other thing is it's quite, um, I'm going to use a different shape now. Instead of that, that square, I'm going to draw a little kind of like a dialogue box like that. And I can run that action. And you'll see it's done exactly the same. It's done the outline, it's filled it with red, and so on. Uh, it's left it selected. I could actually add to that auto action, which is what I'll do now, is I'll, I'll record another step just after the fill, and that step will be deselect. And that means now if I do that auto action here and run it, and you'll see it's deselected that automatically. Now, if you're doing something, uh, and again, I'm, I'm not daft enough to think everyone's going to be wanting to draw red boxes on everything, but uh, if there are other things that you do frequently, you can actually add them then to, we'll add this auto action to the uh, this little selection launcher. So we'll edit our selection launcher, and you'll see main menu pop up, tools, options, auto action. So we'll go in the auto action, uh, and you'll see the default list, and you'll see the, the new one I created there. So we can actually add that there, and you'll see then, that now has its own little box. So I'm going to close or put my auto action back to where it belongs. Um, if I do, and in fact, this time we'll do a little star shape so you can see what I'm doing. And I can then, you can see there, red box. I just tap that and that's it. So you can see how quickly uh, it is to add one of those and how quickly you can use one of those when you've got them. Um, now, I have a list of a million things. I have hardly got through them. So I'm going to move very quickly on from that simple auto action. And we're going to show you some of the advanced features of using panel borders and frames. I think this is a thing that's that's actually quite complicated, missed by a lot of people, I think. Um, so I use these a lot, uh, although I, I do tend to um, work in traditional pencils. So here's a traditional page of pencils I've scanned in. Sorry. <coughs> Uh, what I what I do once I've scanned in a page like this is I will add a panel border. So we'll add a layer, new new layer uh, or new layer uh, frame border folder. So a frame border folder, if you don't know, a frame border is basically uh, the outline around a frame. Uh, this uh, comes up with a line width of uh, 0.13. I like to go for 1.4. That's my kind of that's my default size. And the reason for that actually is I used to have a pen for drawing these panel borders and it was 1.4, so old habits die hard. I've been using that size for ever since then. Uh, so I create a new panel, panel frame and that creates a frame around the page. Now, as you'll see, this is, this is encompassing the entire um, frame, uh, which is no use to me. I need, I need uh, this is quite an elaborate shape. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split it up using divide frame border. Uh, if you, you, what happens when you create a new frame is it creates this folder here. Uh, this one's called frame two because I'd already had one, but we'll, we'll, we'll just rename that frame one. This creates a new panel frame. And a panel frame is essentially a kind of outline with a mask. And you can see the mask is this sort of blue area around here. Uh, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna split this up, roughly split it up. And so you can see kind of, uh, let's see. I'm gonna space uh, a frame border and preferences. I'm gonna use the 
preferences, which is point, uh, five millimeters. There we go. I'm just gonna split that up very simply. Um, now that's not perfect. There's lots, lots and lots of things there I'd like to do with that, um, and I'm going to. One of the first things I wanna do is take this particular frame here and divide it up into one, two, three, four, five, five little chunks. But I want it to be exactly evenly spaced. Now I could sort of eyeball that and go, uh, 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 if I hold, let's see, if I do this, you'll see it's drawn a line. It's not straight, but if I press the shift key, it'll lock in place. So you can very quickly lock five. But there, I mean, the eyeball in that, that, they are not accurate. So <laughs> instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna undo all of those. And there we go. And I'm gonna select that. That individual frame is now selected. You'll see the selections are all there. I can go up then to layer, um, ruler frame, div divide frame border equally. Now what this does is it allows me to split the frame border up into an exact amount. So I want, uh, I want vertical divisions turned off. So I'm only looking at horizontal divisions. I want one, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, there you go, five. Perfect. And now I should have, you'll see, it's come up with those uh, frames. Now what this has done is actually, it's created a folder for each of these frames. So each of these then becomes their own kind of folder and you can do inks within those. It's that's not my preference. That's not how I like to to do these things. Um, what I like to do is have as few folders and and uh, layers as possible. Uh, I'm actually even. This is quite complicated looking document for me. I normally have one layer of pencils, one layer of inks, and part of the reason for that is that when you're uh, digitally drawing, and I'm sure every single person who's done this has, has who's done digital artwork has done exactly this, where what you've done is you've drawn on the wrong layer, or you've tried to erase a layer below what you're doing. So I tend to stick to to one layer for inks, and what that means is then I don't, you know, I don't have to mess around trying to figure out what layer I'm on. So what I'm going to do is go and do almost exactly the same thing we just did there. I so um, layer settings da, 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 ruler frame layer divide frame border equally and you'll see there's a little option here divide folder duplicate layer create an empty folder or not change not change basically means just divide up this don't create any new folders for me and that's what that's done there so at this point I've got now a nice little um, set up which has got roughly what I want it's not exactly what I want I mean I, I you know like many people I've drawn uh, I've done this thing where you know I've, I want this I want Judge Dredd sort of oozing out of the panel and I want I ideally want these panel borders to be slightly rougher in texture uh, and uh, and there are ways to do all of that so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to create a, a kind of breakout panel now I've only got a couple of tools here, so create frames. So we've got create frames, rectangular frame, polyline frame, and frame border pen. Um, what I'm going to use is the polyline frame, uh, and you'll see by default it's using the black panel. It's using the red color, which is the last color I used. Put that back down to black. But I'm going to create a new one. So what I'm going to do is create a new uh, polyline frame by duplicating the existing polyline frame. It's not a, it's not a great name. I'm going to give it a more descriptive name, and the descriptive name is uh, I'm going to give it invisible panel frame or border okay so i'm calling it invisible uh panel border and the reason i'm calling it that is because i'm going to alter some of the sentence here so uh, uh create frame we want to draw a border we want to add to the selected folder uh, and continuous curve brush size as in brush shape tip spray if i'm going to run through all these because none of these are that important um so I'm going to register all those two initial settings. That means if we ever press kind of reset on that, it goes to that, to that again. Uh, let's see. Draw. There's the option there, draw border. I'm going to turn that off. Okay. So because I'm turning that off, that means the border that you see here around here. When I when I create my own border with this, which is what I'm going to do. So I created my own border. When I close this loop here, you'll see it will. Oh, let's see, I'm going to draw it. Actually, I'm going to use the frame there. So I want that uh, dreads eagle to pop out there a bit. So I'm going to draw it crudely over the shape of where that eagle is. By doing that, and you'll see now the panel border has disappeared. What's actually happened is it's kind of recognized that I've drawn a new panel border there. And so it's it's given me some room to work. Um, 
And we can do that then for anything else that we want to sort of jump out of the frame there. And so, for example, down here, I'll see there, that should go away. Now, the way I work is I tend to, um, my, my uh, pencil layer is below the frame. Now, that means that the, the, you can see every single thing that's in the pencil layer as well as every single thing that's in the frame. If I drag the pencil layer into the frame folder, what will happen is it will obey the mask that's set up on the frame folder. So you'll see these things then disappeared. Okay. And it's only where I've cut out areas there on the frame folder that you're able to see the, the panel sort of popping out there. So again, I can, I can um, draw another bit here just to let that out. You see that, uh, and that's kind of. I mean, the advantage of that is it, it hides a lot of stuff for you if, if you don't need it. There's no need to see a lot of the stuff that you've got there. Um, and there's there's another one. So now I have created this invisible panel border. That's always there. I'm going to have that for every every time I want to use that. I don't ever need to recreate that tool. It's there for me, uh, and it means then I can I can if I want to actually I'm going to take. the whole of that top half of that panel away and you'll see it's just where I've left a little bit there but that's okay and get rid of that so you can see now I'm sort of chipping away at the shape of the panel and, and giving me bits in there I can also do things like I can take some of these panel shapes and um, your borders here you've got brush shapes you can then adjust them you can have whatever you want there uh, you can create your own brush shapes I'm going to use uh, wavy line just for the just to have it look slightly different. Um, it's not ideal. I, I would generally create a brand new brush shape that that does something a bit uh, looks a bit uh, kind of more rugged. Um, but you can see how how easy it is to actually create. Kind of there we go. That's that's a slightly more rugged shape there using that spray. And then if you want, you can actually go in and take the edges of each of those panel borders and just sort of move them slightly kind of make them a wee bit sort of even though they're the same size you'll see the whole panel there change in shape and that's because every every alteration that I'm doing here is actually obeying this rule work with another frame border and that means that whenever I alter the shape of one of these things then the other panels have to obey that uh, that movement um, I can turn that off and that's kind of useful so if I turn work with a, with another frame off that means I can now do this and you can get them kind of going a bit more Looney change really. Um, there we go. A little more jagged, a little more crazy, a little more sort of creative then. Um, and that's kind of how you would do that. There are other things that you, you might want to do. For example, this panel here is currently on top of this panel. So you've got one panel. You can see this panel is actually sitting on top of this panel and you might want this panel sitting on top of that panel and the way to do that is to if you select the panel you want to move to the top so everything you're going to do is uh, when you want to change the order of the panels is to move things to the top so I'm going to what you do is essentially select the panel you want to move to the top Control X, I think it's uh, Option X on the Mac, Control X cuts that panel so that panel is now gone but if I do Control V it'll reinsert the panel but it reinserts the panel on top now so it's, it's sort of sitting on top of the other panel. And you'll see that even though the panel borders go into this, they're actually behind this particular panel. There we go. Um, so one other thing you might have is you might have occasionally a panel shape that's a little odd where you have to, you might have, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little, create a brand new document here and just go into, um, Say so you have uh, L-shaped, say so you're, you're after an L-shaped panel like that. You might have a panel like this and an L-shaped panel there. Uh, that is very doable. And the way to do that is if we uh, selection, oh, sorry, layer, new layer folder, or new layer frame border folder. Again, create a new one. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is one of those things, this is an opportunity here to actually create a brand new action. Uh, I generally, what I do with actions is I will create a new action like this for even something that's only one action, like create a new frame folder, but I will insert the save 
just before it. So when I do, uh, when I create the action, so I'll, I'll show you how that happens. If we again call up our action panel, so um, auto action, bring that over just so we can see it again. Um, I will create a brand new action here and we'll call that new frames. So I record. The first thing I always do is I just do a save. And I'll just, uh, just call that test for the moment. The name doesn't matter because what it does is it saves, it, it's, it basically, when you run this next, it will do a save. And then I'll do a uh, layer, new layer frame uh, order folder. There we go. And we can call that whatever we like. I'm just gonna call it panels. And again, the, the name panels is saved and the line width is saved. And so now we've got a panels line width and then we can stop that. Uh, and the reason I do that, I mean, it seems like a small thing, but that's only two actions. One of those actions is save. I do that for almost every action, even I'd be sort of tempted to add it into the red box action because it means you're constantly saving. It means you, if you forget to save as I, I mean, I find Clip Studio really reliable. Uh, and I, But the, the problem with that is I often leave it running for three or four days without thinking to save the document I'm in. But because I use actions so frequently and the actions always save the document before they do anything else, it's very rare that I have a problem. You know, So uh, if I'm doing an action that, that is particularly kind of uh, involved, it will save it once to begin with and then it'll do the whole entire action and it might save it at the end. But generally it'll, it'll be a save right at the start. So. Um, We've got a new frame folder. I'm going to delete that and show you now this action in, in use. So um, you'll see here any document that's been altered at all. You'll see the file name, test, and you'll see a little star. That star means it's been altered since it was saved last. And ideally, you want to save it again. So if I then run the new frames, which I'll do now. PJ, see... this is Fahim. <laughs> Apologies for the interruption. Would you be able to adjust your mic? Uh, we're uh, getting some messages about uh, the mic being a little further away. Okay, is that is that any better? Is that, it feels a lot better, yeah. Yeah, is that, sorry, my apologies for that. I might have coughed and then moved the microphone. <clears throat> okay, perfect. I'll get off now. Okay, sorry. Sorry for that. If if, uh, if you couldn't hear me there, I think I might have coughed and tried to cough away from the mic and accidentally moved the microphone. Um, so, uh, as I was saying there, I have now created this, this dialogue that saves the, the document, creates a brand new frame folder, um, and uh, I can go into that. So it's it's constantly saving the document. And again, these things are all about kind of saving you time and effort and making sure things are going to work for you. Uh, so to recap, what we're trying to do here is create an L-shaped frame. Uh, L-shaped frames are not easy. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, I'm going to, first of all, divide this frame into two, like that. What we really want to do is join this panel to this panel. And as you saw, there was a way to split panels up evenly. Well, there's a way to not to actually join them together again. So I can select the two panels. I can go to uh, layer, um, layer frame and combine frames. And combine frames will take those two panels and just join them together. So now we've got a nice L-shaped panel and we can do all sorts of uh, cool things within that. Um, so. The, the final thing I wanted to show you was sort of working in 3D. I'm not sure if we've got enough time to do an awful lot of that stuff. Um, uh, I have a, a document here that's got some, some sort of 3D uh, stuff in it. Um, on one of the big advantages of EX versus the non-EX, so there's, there's two big uh, features which I think uh, are important. One is that you can work with multi-page documents. Um, as, a, as a generally, having come to Clip Studio Paint uh, from, from Manga Studio, from when it was Manga Studio, uh, my first use of it was not as a digital drawing tool. It was a way to organize my files. It was a way to organize multi-page documents. Um, so for example, this is a, um, what do you call it? This is my uh, a Judge Dread that was published recently by 2000 AD, and you can see here I've got every single page just there, just uh, laid out for me. I have also I'm in the middle of doing a, a 180 page graphic novel, which is uh, in three separate chunks, and each chunk is about 60 pages long, and so I have three documents, and each document is 60 pages. Now the big advantage of it is is um, I think I've, I've been saying is consistency is the most important thing. The I can set up a document with a document size 
and every single page in that document automatically gets that same size. So if I get it wrong at the start, they're all wrong, but if I get it right, they're all right, and I will never make a, a mistake with that. Um, it also means that, for example, I can take two pages and I can join them together so they can become a double page spread. Uh, it means that if I want to export a document, um, I can simply do export pages one to four. Uh, I can export them as JPEGs or pings and so on. And that's kind of, that's the big advantage to me of, of the EX version. Uh, the other, which I'm, I'm gonna to touch on very, very quickly, is just the ability to kind of render 3D objects. Um, I have here uh, a tank. So uh, I think if you've seen some of the other uh, demos, uh, you'll have seen sort of using 3D objects and using this kind of, uh, this option here, which is, um, decrease color, which basically turns it into a very simple flat line art that you can then trace over. Um, EX offers you a feature called, um, uh, it's called uh, line, uh, what's it called? Sorry, I forgot the name of it. I'll just call it up here. Uh, da, 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 da. It is called... Um, 3DLT. Uh, layer, yeah, LT conversion of layer, sorry. I'm, I was looking for it, desperately looking for it there. LT conversion of layer. And that basically takes a 3D object and converts it into a simple line drawing. Uh, it will, if you want, um, it will do things like it'll add sort of extra tone for the object so it can be rounded so you can see it better. I tend to sort of forego all of that because what I really am trying to get to is a simple uh, image that I can then trace over or, or draw over. So an object like this uh, is this is the, the result of an, of an LT conversion layer. You can see it's a very simple line drawing. I will usually just kind of turn that to blue and then I can then start sort of happily drawing uh, new tank details over that. So like so, uh, to my own to to my own taste, to my own uh, you know how I prefer it. Um, so I, I I think and uh, do we have uh, questions then? Because I'm kind of <laughs> I, I don't want to get into too much more because I feel like I've 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 done way more than I uh, talked about these things a lot. So uh, and if I get into anything else, I could be here another three days. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, PJ. Yes, I believe uh, Joanna has been collecting questions and uh, she is going to start asking you these questions. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I'm i still busy collecting some of them. So just okay. give me a second. Okay, no problem. Um, let's start with a very broad question. Um, mm -hmm. What did you study to become a comic artist? Oh, I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst, the worst answer. Um, I basically, like an awful lot of uh, comic artists, I kind of self-taught. Um, so I was reading comics from seven or eight and I just started drawing and drawing and drawing. Um, I actually, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist Declan Shalvey, but um, Declan came to me once with a, for before he'd sort of had any kind of work published at a portfolio review and he showed me his artwork. And I kind of, I more or less said to him, look, if you want to be a comic artist, you'll be a comic artist. It's really about determination and the ability to kind of pick yourself up and and get moving and, and do it um almost every published artist that i am i know kind of taught themselves um now there's you know the flip side of that is you tend to find your own way but that's that's not too bad because it means you end up with your own voice uh, it does mean that some people like me as I said at the start of the the thing i i didn't really start professionally until i was 30 so i had a career before that and it could well be that that you know the, the, that I could have been faster if I had gone to school somewhere, but but that's that's how I ended up doing it. I kind of just I looked at people I liked, and I kind of went, well, how do they do that? How does uh, how does Kevin Nolan draw faces? How does um, Dave Gibbons draw vehicles? How do you know? Um, how does uh, Mike Mignola do shadows? You know, I looked at all the artists that I liked uh, and kind of aspired to be like. And you know, how does Adam Hughes draw everything to look beautiful? How does he do that? And and kind of you, you sort of try and get that information out of the artwork that's there and try and teach yourself that stuff and, and kind of work through it um, but I mean the, the best advice if you want to be a comic artist is uh, I think to take the work any work that you're doing and show it to someone 
that uh, you know if if you have a partner, show it to your partner, but don't say to them, "Is this good?" Because they will always say, "Yes, dear, that is amazing." Uh, what you want to ask them is, "Do you understand what's happening on this page? Do you know what's going on? Can you tell me what tell me what you think is happening here?" And if if they can tell you what they think is happening, if they can if they can go through the page narrating each piece as it as it occurs, that means you've done a good job. And, and you don't need them to say you've done a good job because if they understand it, that's the job of comics. As a comic artist, your job is communication. It's to take a writer's story and communicate that to as many readers as possible. So understanding is very, very important. And it's it's more important than your ability to draw. You can be a, you know, you can be a moderately decent artist, but an amazing storyteller. Uh, and And you will, you know, people will love you for that as a comic artist. You know, I mean, obviously you want to be able to tick all the boxes. You want to be an amazing artist and you want to be an amazing storyteller. But storytelling in comics is king. And, and that's the thing you've got to really look for. And the, and the easiest way to get better at that is to do lots of it and to finish things. You know, to take a story, take a script somewhere and uh, begin at the beginning and finish the entire thing. And even if you're not happy with it, still finish it and show it to people and then move on to the next thing and keep doing that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a follow-up question to that. Um, how did you keep your motivation before you got really into drawing comics and um, became popular as an artist? For for me, um, I, comics was my default position. Drawing Judge Dredd was my default position. When someone would sit down and work and sketch on a telephone pad, I would do the same, but I'd be sketching Judge Dredd. That, that was as simple as that. I, I, it was never. I think because I never expected to draw comics, it was never a thing that I thought was realistic. So I never, I was never kind of put off by failure because I never thought it would happen. So I just kept going anyway. And then I kind of slowly but surely got um, small press stuff. I showed to other people. People would go, "Oh, you're really, you should be doing that professionally." Uh, and I would kind of laugh it off because nine times out of ten. The people that say that to you don't really know what it takes to be a professional artist. They're people. They're people that have seen that you can draw and think, "Well, I can't draw, so you must be professional." Uh, but nine times out of ten, they're they're not. You know, they, they don't really have a, have a clue. Uh, they're very sweet, but that that's kind of about as far as it goes. Uh, so, uh, you you. I mean, for me, drawing is actually it's meditative. It's it's sort of when I'm drawn and I'm in the zone, it's enjoyable. I would do it for free. I would do it all the time uh, if I was allowed. It. I can get grouchy if I have been so I kind of I, I, you, you of course get demoralized when things don't go your way or you don't get the job that you would have liked or somebody else is doing a job that you would like and you know you could do but you're already doing something you know all those usual things get in the way but uh, when I'm sitting down with a piece of paper and a pencil you know or, or you know drawing something fun and cool digitally or you know if I'm drawing Judge Dredd which is a thing I've, I've wanted to draw since I was seven years old I uh, you know I, I'm happy whether I'm doing it for free or doing it for, for pay I'm happy if I'm getting paid obviously but <laughs> it's, it's still happily do it for free okay um, how do you how long do you usually work on a project um, I well, I, generally the division is made up in days per you know, days per page. I, you know, I, I measure everything per page. So for me, uh, a good a good project is a page a day. That's that's a good rate. If you can do a page a day, you can make it as a professional. Uh, because you're paid per page, you sort of want to try and make it a, a point where. You know, if you spend a month on a page, that is not a project you, that will ever pay you anything that, that you can eat on. You know, you, you've got to you've got to be fast enough to do the work and, um, you know, to, to be able to sort of commit to it. Now, having said that, I'm because I'm a 2000 AD artist, most of the projects I've done have been shorter. So it's it's been uh, they've been six pages or seven pages or you might get 10 weeks of six pages um, and those are fun. I find those short things fun to do because you're sort of in and out and you can try a different art style or you can go slightly crazy and do something different. Um, it's harder on a longer project. Uh, at the moment, this this graphic novel I'm doing is 180 pages because you've got to be consistent for 180 pages and that's that represents about nine months worth of work. So um, over nine months, it's very hard to stay because you inevitably get better. So, you know, if you're drawing that much work, you get better over time. And so you're looking at older work and going, oh, I could redraw that. <laughs> I could just, but that, that would sort of kill you dead. You've got to keep moving forward at all times, like a shark. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's go a bit more into, into your work uh, flow. Mm -hmm. um, how do you recommend setting up your workspace? 
Ah, right. Well, I have a problem in that, and I, oh my goodness, I, what a problem to have. I have a 27 inch uh, iMac, uh, or sorry, not iMac, 27 inch Cintiq Pro, which is on a on a, a Logi, what's it, Ergotron uh, arm. So it's it's mounted on a sort of arm, which I can move and, and uh, pull out from the computer and stuff and tilt and so on. Um, but I find that the keyboard that I've, used, I've got, which is a, uh, it's a, a a wireless keyboard i keep it to my left so it's within hand distance and then the mouse is over to the right but the key the screen is so big that sometimes they're quite far apart and so it's, it can be a little bit of a problem and you sort of work your way through it i try as much as possible to be able to do everything on screen so uh, this is one of the reasons i think the command bar is so useful because you put as many things on screen as you can so that all you're ever doing is using the the pen on 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 the uh, cintiq although having said that even though it's a 27 inch screen what i find actually the biggest thing that i do is instead of having um instead of working on one big page like this, instead of looking at this as close as I can, what I tend to do is I, I you can go to window uh, and go to, I think it's canvas new window. And what that does is it makes a duplicate of the window that you're currently working on. So I now have two of these. So I have that one that's up close and that one that's far away. I can then take that and drag it over to the side. And so I can now actually have two views of the same document. And so, um, I mean, in terms of working, that means I can actually, I, I tend to work within a kind of smaller physical area. So um, I tend to sort of, my drawings happen within a, a kind of uh, five by five uh, inch area, even though it's a, such a massive screen. Um, but, you know, I, I tend to, let's see, I'm trying to find the right tool here to use. Um, if I'm here, I would I would draw within an area typically that size and move the screen around all the time, so I'm always drawing in that size. But having said that, that means on the right hand side of the screen, I can see the full image of whatever it is I'm working on. So I've got so that's one big advantage of the big big screen. The disadvantage is my keyboard's too far away and my arms are too short. <laughs> Um, in terms of workspace in Clip Studio, do you use the mm -hmm. default layout or do you have your special setup? Um, I I find some of the Clip Studio is an amazing program and. It, one of the faults with it is there's so many ways it can be configured, so it's very hard to find an ideal. So what I tend to do is anything that I use frequently, I, I end up putting them on the command bar, and anything I don't use frequently just sort of sits wherever it sits. It, it, it doesn't matter to me too much. And on the again, on this 27-inch screen, it's so much screen real estate. It, it doesn't matter if you're, I mean, even this view, which has got all the, the command bars out, is actually, you know, it's still plenty of workspace. On the iPad Pro, um, which um, is is the uh, what do you call it is great, but on the iPad Pro, I find that there's just not enough room, so I am much more meticulous about um, what I put on there. Uh, and what I tend to find is I kind of I start moving tools around, and I, I use depending on what I'm doing, I use pencils and so on. I use pencils, inks, and coloring, but everything is really about adding on to that command bar and adding on to the selection thing once i've put those the right tools in there then it's it's very easy to do this color dread that i'm showing you now actually i said, I said uh, to fahim and, and yourself earlier was done on on the ipad pro and it's a like seven foot tall image at uh, 150 dpi the full color thing with multiple layers and that was drawn on an ipad pro so you can imagine trying to draw seven foot tall image on a on a 12.9 inch screen but having the uh, having the keyboard shortcuts and having the ability to kind of uh just have so many things on that command bar means that I never really, I never really need to see it like this. I never need to see these these sub tools and the navigator and so on. I tend to use it like this, where you just see the image, the big image. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So you talked a lot about auto action. Um. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example of an auto action that you use on a daily or at least regular basis? Uh, yeah, well, there's there's a couple of them. One is that uh, I didn't get doing this here, but one of the things that I do frequently, every brand new project, so I'll create a brand new page here just to show you. Every brand new project I do starts with um, a new document. Say the document is, uh, say the comic's 22 pages. I'll create a 24-page document uh, or 25-page document, and then I'll create um, two, uh, at, the, at the end of the 22 pages, I'll create uh, in these two, three blank pages, what I'll do is I'll make a um, a frame border like this, uh, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to do it exactly because uh, I'll make a frame border like this, which I'll then split into 
Uh, six. Here we go. Um, bu, 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 bu. I'm gonna do it because. So, this is why I created all auto actions for this. So I create a little frame border like this. Uh, I then sort of drop the opacity of that down, and then I can. Uh, and create this a layer below it, which I'll always put in gray. And what this does is it allows me to draw thumbnails. That's all this does. This is just a little area for me to draw thumbnails. If I'm doing a, a project, at the end of the project, at the last couple of blank pages of it, I'll create a page with thumbnails. So I'll put little thumbnails here. So the, the creation of this frame folder and splitting it up into six is added, I have it in auto action. So whenever I want to create a frame uh, like this, I just go, Create, create this frame, and it just does it. Like, well, there's no messing around, it just does it, and suddenly it's there. So that's one one example. The other thing I do is um, in the uh, creating of a, uh, taking a 3D object and turning it into a line art, I have a, an auto action that will do that, but what it'll also do is it will take the line art layer that I've done and convert it to a light blue, a cyan blue, which means that when I print it, the cyan then is uh, what's called non-repro blue, which I can then scan into the computer and it will it'll just blank out that blue area so I can just ink over it without without having to kind of clean up the pencils. So there's a couple of them I, I've got. Yeah. Uh, there's a few of them I use all the time. And I kind of half forget that they're there because I use them so frequently. They, they're almost part of the software now for me. They're, I kind of keep thinking they're there, but they're not now because I've got a clean setup here. Yeah, OK. Um, a lot of people are asking what kind of, um, which pencils and brushes you use in Clip Studio. Um, well, like many people, I, I tend to use Frendon's brushes. Um, I have, uh, I use a, a Frendon's pencil. It's, I think it's a 6H pencil that he uses, and I use the standard G nib, and that's it. I, I, I even with analog and traditional tools, I tend to stick to one tool, uh, and part mm -hmm. of that is part of that speed. Uh, you know, if you, if you can get if you can get the same G pen, the digital G pen, to give you texture of metal and texture of fur and texture of bark and texture of water, if you can get that same t tool to do all of that without changing tools, it makes you a better, faster artist because instead of having to pick the right tool and spend, you know, I mean, I, 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 with Frendon's brushes, there's about 600 brushes there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other uh, companies that, that that have brushes, and I've got all of them. And there's hundreds and hundreds of brushes, and and I could spend a, like months just looking through for the perfect brush. Whereas if you can do all of these things with the G brush, you're you know you can do it so much quicker. Um, having said that, they're fun to play with. You know, <laughs> I love I love playing with all of those brush tools. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question which mm -hmm. is a bit more elaborate too it's like do you have any tips about comic composition and organizing panels yes okay all right well there there is um when i started drawing comics there was a thing called the 2000 ad 10 commandments um that was basically a very simple set of rules for how to do comics and if you can hunt those down and find them they're, they're very good for almost anything they're really about clarity uh, and comics is all about clarity. Uh, one of the first and simplest rules is that um, the first person to speak is on the left. That's, I mean, that's so simple. It's, it's, it's always surprising that you've got to say these things out loud and then you realize, well, it's not obvious unless you've done it a billion times before. But say I have, uh, so let's, let's pretend this is one panel here and I've got two people talking and this is the first person to speak and that's the second person to speak. So the logical thing to do is to make that and that happen, okay? But lots of people, for whatever reason, end up doing this. And so, so they kind of move these things around. So when I read a script, I'll see the script and I'll see the dialogue. John says this, Fred says that, and Stephen says this. My first thoughts on composition is, well, how do I make this work so that John, Fred, and Stephen are in that order? You know, so that's John, that's Fred, that's Stephen. So John, Fred, and Stephen. And that's what the thumbnail stage is all about. It's all about figuring out how do I put them in the, that order. Now, sometimes you'll think to yourself, well, that's going to be dead easy because they're always going to be in that order. But I'm doing, for example, the story that I'm doing right now has uh, an airplane in it, and it's an old biplane. And in this old biplane, there are uh, three people in the plane, one at the back, one in the middle, and one at the front, which means at any one time, they're always in this order. So, so those people are always in that order, which means if this person speaks first, I've got to figure a way to show this so that he speaks on the left. So he's on the left of the panel. So I've got to figure out how do I make this guy 
be the first person to speak, even though the order of it might be two and then three. So the, 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 and these are all about problem solving. They're all about, well, how do I think about making this person move there? And then whenever you get to the second panel of a, of a page and you've gone, you've gone, oh, well, I figured this out, that guy, then that guy, then that guy. You get to the second panel and the panel has them moved around in order because the writer has basically written a different piece of dialogue, hasn't changed location. The characters are still the characters. Now you've got to figure out, oh, how do I do this again? But now the characters are in a different order because the different person speaks first. So that's you, you're always trying to figure that problem out. Um, I think a lot of uh, young artists make the mistake of just going, oh, I'll just draw that in the order. I'll just draw that. And, and without thinking about left to right, you know. So, so the first person to speak is always on the left. So your speaking order is like that, which means you've got, uh, you know, one, two, three. It's, it's so simple and yet it's often missed. And it, it is really about clarity. So you, you, you map those people like so. So that, that's okay. that's the big thing in, in terms of comics. You know, it's, it's just making sure that, and, and if you can do that, then, then you're onto a winner. The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, don't get too clever with panel borders. Make sure they're nice and simple. Um, if you're going to do, try to avoid doing things like this, where what you've got is two panels stacked and then a third one. So one, two, three. And the reason you avoid that is because um, it's very easy to misread that as one, two, three. So that's a, that's a simple, simple little thing. It's, it's actually okay to do it the other way around, one, two, three, because it's hard to, you know, you can't really get that wrong. So you're always reading in a zigzag, you know, it's sort of left to right and down, left to right and down, left to right and down. And so you're always trying to think about zigzags. Um, and in terms of composition, try as best as you can to uh, give some depth to whatever you're, it is you're doing. So even, even on this where you've got three people talking, you might do one nice and close and then the other one slightly further away and then the third one even further away than that. And now you've got a little bit of depth into the panel, even though there's, and now they're still left to right. So one, two, three, one, two, three. They're still left to right, but there's a bit of depth now. So that guy's very close. And then you can you can do things like, uh, you know, fill him with black and, and uh, let's see, let's make him a silhouette. Silhouettes are great. There's, he's a he's a very badly drawn silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. and uh, one other thing I would suggest is uh, if you're ever stuck, there is a thing called Wally Wood's 22 panels that always work, which is a sheet that Wally Wood, uh, famous artist, once made out for other artists. Uh, it's it's 22 panels that always work, or ways to get around stupid writers. I think was the subtitle. It's essentially it's a a guide to very simple compositions that always work. They're always great, and they're good to learn from. And they're a good way to bounce uh, into into kind of new ideas if you're stuck with how to how to do something. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. I think that wraps it up nicely from thank, my well, end. Thank you. The question. I think we have time for this time. All right. Thank you so much, Joanna. And thank you so much, PJ, for your time. Um, that was an amazing webinar. I learned a lot. I'm sure all the <laughs> attendees learned a lot as well. Um, so thanks again. And thank you to the attendees for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Um, for more information on Clip Studio Paint, please go to graphicsly.com as well as clipstudio.net forward slash en. And for more information about PJ and uh, following him, please go to his t Twitter profile. Paul J. Holden. And then also, if you'd like to see his portfolio, his website's available. That's the last link on this page here. With that, thank you so much, PJ. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.